Direct from the Grand Ballroom of New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel, Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Van Johnson in tonight's presentation of... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite recreates the story of the first international automobile race. The story is based on fact and is called Around the World. Our star, Mr. Van Johnson. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite with greetings from the Great Easter Parade of Stars Automobile Show in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. On display are 40 new car models in exciting colors. They were produced by leading car manufacturer members of the Autolite family. Here, too, are spectacular action displays, working models of a Navy torpedo and aircraft carrier, along with other interesting exhibits provided by our armed forces. Plus, special cars styled by leading American and European designers. Record-breaking crowds of enthusiastic visitors have seen the show since Saturday's opening, and before it closes Thursday, many more are expected to see this spring spectacle. And now, as a special treat for our visitors here at the Easter Parade of Stars Auto Show, and to you at home, Autolite has brought our cast and our star, Van Johnson, to the stage of the Waldorf's Grand Ballroom for the true and exciting story of the one and only auto race around the world. This famous race took place in 1908, just three years before Autolite developed the first two-unit, six-volt electrical system used as original equipment. But now... Let's listen. Van Johnson is appearing by arrangement with MGM, producers of the Technicolor musical Small Town Girl, starring Jane Powell and Farley Granger. And now, transcribed, Autolite presents Around the World, starring Mr. Van Johnson, hoping once again to keep you in... Suspense! My name is George Miller. These are my opponents, Monsieur Bossier de saint chaffre Enchanté. I am driving the Didion. My crew is also French. Vive le sport. Lieutenant Hans von Koppen. Driving a Protoss, a German car, as are my technicians. German. Signor Anthony Scafolio. Uh, Come Italian with my crew, with driver of the Zust automobile. The gentlemen you have met, and a couple of others who you will meet presently, who are riding with me, all of us are going to have a race in automobiles around the world. New York to Paris by way of Siberia. It's 1908, Lincoln's birthday. A bright and sunshiny day, Times Square, New York, 10 a.m. I'm the driver of a four-cylinder, 60-horsepower car taken from stock, the Thomas Flyer. However this thing comes out, and I'm not offering any excuses, but in all fairness, you should know that the other cars have been built especially for this race. But the Thomas Flyer, anybody can go and buy one off the floor. The members of my crew are Montague Roberts, who knows about maps and motors, and Mr. Colby, correspondent for the Combined News Services. How do you do? Hello. Gentlemen, are you ready? All right, gentlemen. How far is it to Buffalo? We're only 50 miles from 43rd Street in Times Square, George, and running second. The Dion is still ahead of us. I didn't ask I you how you we... I'd like to make an observation, gentlemen. About the rain again, Mr. Colby? Yes, of course. As long as we're going around the world together, I don't think we should immediately exhaust whatever food of conversation we have in store for each other. I think the things at hand are the elements, for instance. Please talk to us about the rain, Mr. Colby. A prediction. Because of rain, one day an alert automobile manufacturer will produce a top attached to the body which can be lowered or raised. And a soul can sit in comfort and not be drenched like now. Mark my word. Montague. Yes, George. How far to Buffalo? Any observations about the mud, Mr. Colby? 
Mr. Colby. He can't hear you, George. He slid down on the floor and back and pulled his raincoat over him and the rug and... Get out! Get out! The French car, they're stuck in the mud. Give it the gun, George. Oh, George, we could have passed them. We can't them. just leave them sitting here. Hi, monsieur. Stop. All of a sudden, no road. Only mud. Oh, we'll give you a hand. Hey, you're really in there deep. Your American mud is of a peculiar viscous quality. My men have not the strength There's to... some wooden planks in back of my car. You can lift the back end up and slip them under. Monty. Sure. Monty will tell your men what to do. Hello. Monty. Monty. Be careful of Mr. Colby. He's on the floor thinking about the elephant. Well, how do you like it, monsieur? Ah, tell us for rain or mud. It is hot of it. Soon it will be buffalo. Tell me, buffalo, it is a nice place. You can get a hot meal. Never been there, but I'm sure you... Such a day. I tell you. Mr. Colby was saying a while back that someone's going to invent a top you can put up when it rains. Uh, we French have already outmoded this proposed invention. What? Attendee, one moment. The invention of which there is no absolute. Cognac. A plate vous, monsieur. Well, thank you, monsieur. A toast. A toast. To our men who are crazy enough to join us around the world by way of Siberia. I'll drink to that. Here's the bottle. Hold on to it, monsieur. A toast. To your gallantry, monsieur. For the help. Okay, George, fix them up fine. All the thanks in the world. Au revoir. Adieu. Nice fellow, yeah. The boys he's got with him are princes, too. Well, now you're standing out here in the mud. Oh, stuck. I know it, I know it. What have you got in that bottle, George? Cognac. <laughs> Three hours later, the rain stopped. Then a rainbow came. His name was Pat Kendall, and he was driving a team of horses. He helped us out of the mud. Then he led the way for us into Buffalo, still behind the French car. After Buffalo, Toledo, then Chicago. And we were a day ahead of everybody. Omaha, Cheyenne, Ogden. And we were four days ahead of the other cars. Down embankments, across desert, forging rivers, over flats and over hills. Then 60 miles outside of Ogden. The tumbleweed. What about them, Mr. Colby? I'm uh, no mechanic, you know. What about the tumbleweeds, Mr. Colby? Uh, riding over them the way you do. We've already discussed that, Mr. Colby, when you were asleep. Oh, uh, Mr. Colby. Yes, Montague? You're a correspondent for a whole syndicate of newspapers. Aren't you supposed to take notes of something? How can you do that when you sleep so much? A good question. Well, how can you do it? I am a journalist. So? My dear Mr. Miller, when a journalist has seen one tumbleweed... He can close his eyes and imagine a vastness of tumbleweeds, hundreds of square miles of tumbleweeds, such as we are now negotiating. Wake me at the next town. I'm afraid not. Why not, Mr. Miller? You are quite right about the tumbleweeds riding over them. They are liable to foul the transmission. And that's why you won't be able to sleep, Mr. Colby. We're going to ride on the railroad ties. Really? Really. Besides, how do you think we're going to cross that river up ahead? Hmm. Why? What? Oh, here we go. How do you like riding on railroad ties, Mr. Colby? I will. George, what? I haven't driven since Cheyenne. Let's change places, huh? There's a trestle up ahead. I know. You're getting all of that. On the other side of the trestle. If we go over into that river, I want it to be my fault, not anybody else's. Mr. Miller, have you ever driven over a railroad trestle before? No. Don't look so worried, Mr. Colby. George. Yeah, I hear it. A train. How far in back of us is it? Near as I can judge, it's getting closer. Hurry up, George. What does that train expect me to do, drive into the river? How far now, Mr. Colby? Mr. Colby. He's on the floor again, George. Can't you go fast? We'll be on the other side in a few seconds. Then we can... Turn it off, lads. Hold on tight. Now, Monty. Wait a minute. All right. Move over, will you? Yeah. A 
Don't look at me like that, George. I Let's just... get out and see. I'll get under the car. Marty, come here. Mm. What do you see? I don't see any clutch shaft. That's one thing I see. Oh. Cracked right off. Where are we, Marty? Under a Thomas Flyer in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Mind if I ask you another question, Marty? Go right ahead. How far from a town? A good-sized town. One that would have a blacksmith. About 30 miles. That way. Well, let's get out from under here. Oh, uh... Over there on the sand, George, the other part of the clutch shaft. Uh Uh-huh. We've got to get the part to a blacksmith. There's no two ways about it. Uh, somebody's going to have to walk 30 miles. Somebody who's had a lot of rest. Mr. Colby! Mr. Colby returned 16 hours later. The blacksmith returned him in a wagon. Mr. Colby was sleeping in back of it. The clutch shaft was repaired and the Thomas Flyer and the three of us were ready to go again. So we went. We arrived in San Francisco 12 days ahead of the other contestants. They gave us a cup and we left for Seattle. When we arrived there, they gave us a cup. And according to the prearranged route, we loaded the Thomas Flyer on board a steamer and sailed for Valdez, Alaska. It was very cold in Valdez. My word, it's cold. Many people in Valdez had never seen an automobile before. And as a token for our achievement, they gave us a cup. They showed us a smaller cup which they were saving for the Frenchmen who were ten days behind. On April 8, when the snow drifts were piled from three to twelve feet high, we left Valdez for the Yukon and the Bering Straits, which were frozen over this time of year so we could drive straight to Asia. We were thankful for the foresight of bringing chains along, a new innovation. And thankful, too, for the efficiency of the motor of the Thomas Flyer at 20 degrees below zero. Headway was very slow. Three days of it, and we only covered 22 miles. Thunders. What did you say, Mr. Colby? Thunders. When you've seen one of them, you've seen... Yes, we know, Mr. Colby. It is bleak, isn't it? George. Yes. If anything went wrong Don't think about it. Talk about something else. The German car was in Omaha when we got to Seattle. I know. The Italians in Salt Lake City. I know. The French, these months. We know all about that, Marty. You say something, Mr. Colby. I was just going to say that... What was that? Get out of the car, quick! An avalanche! One! Marty. Yep. Mr. Colby, look at the car. It's covered. Well, let's start digging, boys. Can't get caught here. Oh, all our equipment's covered. The, the shovel. Improvise, Mr. Colby. Use your hands. Oh? Hey! Hey! Fellow in snowshoes. Wonder what he wants. Hey, there! Howdy. Howdy. Hello. Oh. You the fellas driving an automobile around the world? That's right. Where's your automobile? Under the snow. We had a little... Snow uh, slide, eh? Have them around here all the time. Well, I'm glad I caught you fellas. Oh, we are too. We could use them. They sent me out from Valdez to find you. Got something to tell you. Tell us? You fellas are gone the wrong way. Wrong way? The roads of this race have been changed. You don't go through Alaska. It can't be done anyhow. The barren straits don't freeze over. What? Here and there, they turn to mush, but they don't freeze over. Never have. Then what are we supposed to do? Go back to Seattle. That's all I know. Automobile in Alaska. That don't make no sense at all. Well, come on, I'll give you a hand. Dig you out. I, uh, I hope this little side trip didn't lose you boys the race. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Van Johnson in Around the World. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking again for Autolite and the colorful Easter Parade of Stars automobile show in the grand ballroom of New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Here are 40 exciting car models 
produced by manufacturer members of the Autolite family. In the balcony overlooking the ballroom is a 38-piece band of the Women's Army Corps. In rooms surrounding the ballroom are special action displays dramatizing the latest engineering advancements of the automotive industry, as well as special exhibits featuring outstanding accomplishments of our armed forces. Autolite is proud to be a part of the great automotive industry and to have contributed to the development of today's fine cars. Autolite serves the greatest names in the industry. Tonight, in the climax to the second annual Autolite Family Salute Program, Autolite is privileged to salute distinguished members of the Autolite family whose cars are on display at the Easter Parade of Stars Automobile Show and to salute their dealers throughout the world for our many years of close association. And now, Autolite brings back to our soundstage Mr. Van Johnson in Elliot Lewis's production of Around the World, a story based on fact and well calculated to keep you in suspense. This is George Miller again. I'd like for you to hear a few comments from my opponents in the Round the World automobile race. Senor Anthony Scafolio. I wish to tell you how much I enjoyed the trip by boat from Seattle to Yokohama. The fact that we come in 12 days behind Americans to Seattle was due to an oversight by a navigator. Thank you, senor. Now, Lieutenant Hans von Koppen. This is not possible that we arrived six days behind the Americans to Seattle. However, we are happy to be in Yokohama. Monsieur Bossier de saint chaffre What does it matter that the Americans waited a week for us? The wine on the boat to Yokohama was deplorable. We arrived in Yokohama on May 10, 1908. All the cars were unloaded by sampan since there were no docks. All the contestants rested, saw the sights, and learned to eat with two pieces of wood which are called chopsticks. During the short time we were there, the student among us... Mr. Colby of the newspaper syndicate learned a few Japanese words. Biru is beer, Obasan is woman, Kawaii is pretty face, Genki Des is I am happy. Our stay in Japan was pleasant. All of us drove to Kobe and were loaded onto a boat, and we sailed for Vladivostok, arriving there May 17. The race to Paris was resumed except for the Italian car, whose crew liked the ocean voyage so much that they were last seen sailing for the Mediterranean. From Vladivostok to Harbin, a refueling point, we arrived ahead of the Germans, but the French beat us by half an hour. Hello, Miller. Hello. Hello, monsieur. Well, you beat us. <laughs> the race is yet to be won. Have you refueled? A moment ago. I saw your car, so I thought to wait to bid you adieu. Yeah, well, adieu. And to save you some time. Oh? There is no more gas to be had at the fueling station. What do you mean, no more gas? Uh, my American speech is not at the best. I do not know how else to say it. Uh, let me think. How else can I say it? Is it? I have it. I have bought all of it. All of the gasoline. In order to cross the bigness of Siberia. So, there is no more gas. Adieu. Hello, my I must say that was rather unsporting. Marty, go ask the man if he has any more gas. Right. You have no idea what I shall do when we finally get to Paris. What are you going to do, Mr. Colby? I shall lodge a protest with the Rules Committee. <laughs> Forget it. Anyhow, I don't think I like Siberia very much. Well, you're going to see a lot of it, Mr. Colby. It's the biggest country... Oh, George! Ever. What about it, Marty? No gas. It was Monty, in his charming way, who got the gas. There was an army outpost in Harban. The army of His Imperial Majesty, the Tsar of all the Russias. Monty introduced himself and his charm at the officers' club... And in a little while, introduced a variation on the game of poker known as Spit in the Ocean. American money against the Tsar's gasoline. Monty won. Proposed maneuvers of the Harban outpost of the army of his imperial majesty, the Tsar of all the Russians, was delayed for some time. 
we headed into the wilderness of Siberia. How far to the lake, Marty? I figure Lake Baikal is about 50 miles away. If we miss the boat that crosses it, we'll lose two days. Uh, we're well aware of that fact, Mr. Colby. Don't worry about it. We'll be there tomorrow morning for sure. Unless the French get there first, or the Germans. I haven't seen the Germans, but we passed the French. I'd like to remind you that we should not cross our... What's that up ahead? Voices. People on them. In such a locale, they're known as Tartars. They formed a line, George. You better slow down. Tartars are direct descendants of Genghis Khan. History tells us that Genghis Khan put two million people to the sword. The hobby of these people is beheading strangers. They're on to the teeth, George. Let's go out and talk to them. Oh, hi there. You try it, Marty. Uh, hello. Mr. Colby, have you ever had occasion to learn Tartar talk? Mr. Colby. Uh-oh. Here he comes, George. Now, he must be seven feet tall. Hello, Chief. We're just riding through. We're on our way to St. Petersburg. You talk to him, Marty. Oh, what do I say? Oh, something charming. Uh, nice country you have here, Chief. George. <laughs> <laughs> you like the horn, Chief? <laughs> Monty, give him the horn. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> uh, he'll only be a minute, Chief. <laughs> Hurry up, Monty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here you are, Chief. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute, Chief. That's the wheel. We need the wheel. Blow the horn, Chief. Here. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> Our crossing of the rest of the Siberian wastes was remarkable only in Mr. Colby's remarking that we hadn't seen the French car for a long time. As a matter of fact, we never saw the French again. We lost only a few minutes at Omsk when we had to stop to let the Trans-Siberian Railroad train go by. Just before we were ferried across the Volga River, we passed Lieutenant Koppen and the crew of the Protos automobile. We were now in the lead. We arrived in St. Petersburg on Thursday, July 23. We were the first to arrive, and there were festivities in our honor. What a reception. My word. In, in the name of His Imperial Highness, Tsar of all the Russias, I welcome you to St. Petersburg. We're very glad and to... And in full recognition of your remarkable achievements as the force to cross the motherland by automobile, I have been commanded by His Imperial Majesty, Tsar of all the Russias, to present a token of our admiration. Boris, the cop. Here. Take... In the name of the Thomas Flyer Corporation of Detroit, Michigan, I am proud and happy to accept the cup. Mr. Colby. Yes, Mr. Miller. Put this cup with the cups. And now a toast. Boris, the glasses. Here, gentlemen. Take. Boris, the vodka. To his imperial majesty, the Tsar of all the Russias. To Teddy Roosevelt, president of the United States of America. George, over there, the Protoss. Lieutenant von Koppen. But Germans. Thank his imperial majesty for us. We've got to go. Uh, uh, first, a toast. Uh, uh, Boris. Uh, to her imperial majesty, uh, Tsarina of all the Russians. Uh, to the Rough Riders. We're in a race here, you know. We've got to... Uh, uh, Boris. Uh, to St. Petersburg. A jewel in the crown of his imperial majesty, uh, Tsar of all the Russians. We've really got to go. Uh, drink. Uh, to Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> now... Now let there be music and the festival and dancing. Uh, Boris. Sixteen hours. Sixteen precious hours. We couldn't get away. We tried to, but we couldn't. Finally, at six o'clock in the morning, we left St. Petersburg. From there to Berlin, where we were told that the Protoss car was a half a day ahead of us. That was on July 24. We refueled and went on. The roads were better and we made good time. Hanover, Dusseldorf, Cologne, across Luxembourg and into France. Very good time, but still trailing the Germans in the Protoss car. Then into Reims, still behind the Germans. And the next day, on the morning of July 30, we were outside of Paris. Just outside of Paris. George, look, the Protoss. Yeah. Hurry. Well, what do you think I'm trying to do, Mr. Colby? That's the boy, George. We're gaining. Mr. Colby, throw everything out of the car. I was about to suggest that. Well, do it. Yeah, yeah. 
We're gaining, George. We're gaining. The cops, too, Mr. Miller. The cops, too. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Hey, Von Koppen, what kept you? Where have you been? You'll have not come yet. You'll have not. I can't hear you, Von Koppen. There's the finish line, George. All those people. My word. from New York to Paris, almost 14,000 miles in the Thomas Flyer automobile. Our total running time was 88 days. We arrived 102... We averaged 152 miles a day over all kinds of country and every sort of climate. We climbed mountains, forded streams, drove through mud and traversed sandy deserts. We won the New York Times $50,000 first prize and we had our pictures in every paper in the world. But mostly it was a tribute to our automobile. We proved something. An American stock car circled the globe. And we're not anybody special. Anybody can do it. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Van Johnson. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite and the worldwide Autolite family. Tonight, as the crowning achievement of the second annual Autolite family salute program, we have brought you a special broadcast direct from the Easter Parade of Stars automobile show at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. Tomorrow night, the Autolite family will join in a reception and supper party honoring all women's branches of our armed services. Also, Irene Dunn, Rosalind Russell, Van Johnson, and Robert Merrill. It's for the benefit of our Armed Services Emergency Relief Funds. The Easter Parade of Stars Automobile Show, with its many new car models produced by manufacturer members of the Autolite family, will be open all day Wednesday and Thursday. Admission is free. Next week... The story about a man who dreamed of someday having all the money he would ever need and one day found a way to make his dream come true. It's called The Great Train Robbery. Our star, Mr. Fred McMurray. That's next week on... Suspense! Suspense was transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Moravec and conducted by Lud Luskin. Around the World was written for Suspense by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and was based on fact. Featured in the cast were Alan Hewitt, Ted Osborne, Larry Haynes, Steve Roberts, Danny Ocko, and Cameron Andrews. And remember, next week, Mr. Fred McMurray in The Great Train Robbery. This is the CBS Radio Network.